<laughs> I was like myself. I was like, who's that? <laughs> that was me. So I'll be right back. But uh, folks, we are back with uh, my friend Samuel Nehemiah. And as far as we get a chance to see why he's here and understand what uh, reason that God has brought him here. So I'm excited about that. But like I was saying, as far as birth to death, I mean, this guy's story about what he had to work with and his challenges. Um, Mr. Nehemiah, how you doing? Very fine. All right. How, uh, uh, could you tell us uh, who you are and why you're here in San Diego? First of all, I want to thank you very, very much, Dr. Hutch, for having me here in the studio. Yeah. It's, it's a pleasure. Yeah. And like I said, my name is Samuel Nehemiah. I'm originally from Nigeria. Um, I came to the United States six years ago. Oh, okay. Yes, and um, why, how I came was I qualified for the Paralympics, oh. and that brought me here. Oh, I see you got that Charger hat on. Didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> six years, you don't know nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been here as a uh, an athlete, correct? Oh, correct. an athlete. What 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 kind of games? What, I do um, wheelchair racing. I concentrate on sprint events, 100 meters, 200 meters. I, I love speed. That is why I'm into wheelchair racing. Although I have a new passion for wheelchair basketball too. Oh, so okay. I, I've been playing that. And I like the compact sports sometimes. Uh, <laughs> what, uh, what is it that uh, puts you in a wheelchair? Yeah, that's a good question actually. I, like I said, I was born in Nigeria. I was born in a remote part of Nigeria where um, not too many cars and not too many um, bikes or bicycle bicycle go to. And when I was born, I I didn't get the shot as a kid. So because not people don't go there. What kind of shot? What are you talking shots about? Shots as a kid, you know, you get the shots to um, prevent you from getting all kinds of oh, diseases. Oh, vaccinations. Correct, oh, okay. correct. Right. And um, four years old, I got up one morning and noticed that I couldn't use my legs anymore. And my mom had to carry me and rushed me from one place to another, just for them to tell me, tell her what was wrong with me until um, I believe, uh, my uncle now now asked them to take me to a medical doctor where they confirmed that I have a virus called polio. Polio? Yes. Wow. It's still very, very rampant in Nigeria today. Oh, man. Yeah. So that was when they realized that and my mother was just devastated yeah. to see that I, I wouldn't be able to use my legs anymore. How old were you at this time? Four years. Four years old. Right. Man. And then uh, what, what far as what your uncle did, what happened when they took you to the doctor? Yeah, they realized, uh, my, the uncle, my, the doctor actually told my mother that I won't be able to use my legs. I will crawl all my life. And now my mother started crying, couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, and she was just losing weight, weight drastically. Yeah. That was when my uncle now got scared. Now took me away from her, to far away to an orphanage. Why? Yeah, he took me to this orphanage and told them that I, my parents died. Yeah. Came back and told my parents that I died too. So you mean your uncle took you to an orphanage and told them that your parents died, and then he went back to them and told them that you died? Correct. Oh, Why he did that, I don't even know. He said it's all for good. Oh, so he said. Oh, so so what what happened? Why you was how long were you in this orphanage? Oh, I stayed there. 27 years old, actually, I, that was when I left the orphanage. So we're talking about 23 years I spent in that orphanage. 23 years in the orphanage? Yes. And yes. how old were you were when your uncle took you there? Four years old. Four years old. Four years old, yeah. So what, what was your life like in that orphanage? Oh, a lot of things happened to me in the orphanage. A few things just to, to start it off. It's, um, I got there and they were calling us names, names like cripple, names like bastards. And when they walk past us, I'm talking about the matron, supervisors, they're supposed to take care of us, love on us. Yeah. When they walk past us, they kick us. Oh, and they were treating us like nobody. Like nobody. And I was asking, why are they treating us like this? It was later I realized that if you have any type of disability in Nigeria, they see you as a throwaway. It's, it's worthless. Even Unless I'm a person. Correct. You're absolutely oh, correct. Man. And that was really sad. It hurts me really, really bad to, to be getting these names every day. Oh, man. That is just one aspect of it. I remember they used to starve us even. Churches, individuals used to come and donate to the home. That's how we survived. 
and they were keeping this food away from us because they wanted us to look wretched, look hungry, so that we would get more donation. That was their strategy. So you, I, I got so hungry several times that I used to eat flowers even. Oh, eat flowers? Yes. I didn't care if it was poisonous or not. I just wanted to eat something. Oh, man. And then as far as they are, they, you know, how did they, 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 we obviously know that they didn't feed you. I mean, and the treatment wasn't as great. What, what did they do anything physically to y'all guys? Yes, actually they did. I remember I used to have a habit as a kid. Maybe from the fear of being away from my mother and they were treating me like this, I used to wet my bed as a kid. I remember the first morning actually when I got out, out of bed, they just dragged me out of my room, stripped me of my clothes, and they used a whip. There's this whip they call a koboko in Nigeria. Koboko? Koboko. It's the most painful whip you can use on animals. They used it on my back, 30 strokes of it. So every morning I would scream and I would yell, thinking somebody was going to come to my rescue. But nobody came. For eight years of my life, I went through this beating. Eight years of your life? Eight years. Eight, I was, they just beat you every day? Yes. I was 12 years old when I, I stopped working my bed. That is a miracle of its own, which I would like to share with and you. And what, what, how, how was that a miracle? A miracle because these churches came one day and they shared Christ with us. Besides that, they, they, they said we should challenge God. We should put God to test. So as a kid, I understand it to be put him to test, just like they said. Yeah. So that night, I went, knelt on my bed, and I prayed. I said, God, why am I going through all this? The shame. Everybody call me the bed weather. I go to school. I come back. They call me the bed weather. If you can take the shame from me, I will, I will worship you for life. Yeah. In addition to that, I also said, um, if you don't take this from me, I will never worship you until I go to my grave. So when I say it's a miracle, I got up the next morning and I didn't wet my bed. Oh, Amen. Amen. Yeah. It, was the, it was great because that alone made me believe that there is a God. Yeah. And I mentioned, you said, and I hear you mentioned you went to school. When did you start school? I mean, you, know, you were four years old and then you stopped wetting your bed when you were 12. Where, where did you go to school? Where did you start going to school? These churches that came, they used to encourage us to talk about Christ. And one day they said, Go to school. Forget about your physical disability. Go to school. Educate your mind. You'll be great. You'll be successful. So I held on to that. I was nine years old then. Nine years old. I started bothering our matron. Take me to school. Take me to school. Finally, she took me to school, which is about a mile and a half away. Registered me. I was excited. Yeah. The next morning, ready to go to school. One of the, the happiest time of my life. Yeah. Only to realize there was no means of transportation. I didn't even have a wheelchair. I didn't have a pair of crutches to walk with. The only way I could get around there was to crawl with my hands and my knees. So you crawled to school? Because I was desperate. I hated myself then. Oh. I wanted a change in my life. So I crawled a mile and a half to school on dirt road under the hot sun in Africa. Oh, and every day? I did that for you, three years. You were determined to go to school because that was something to get you away from where you were. Absolutely correct. I was ready to get away from the situation I was in. I didn't like myself. Nobody saw me as anything. Anything that could change the way I was then, I was ready to do it. So nobody, I mean, I know there's rocks and all kinds of snakes and things like that, and you crawl. Yes, my hands were with calluses. My knees were cracking and bleeding. Three years of my life, I just didn't stop. I said I wanted to see the end of it. God helped me, I was going to see the end of it. Oh. So I said. Yeah, so you end up crawling in school. I mean, as far as just going to school, I mean, did you learn anything? I mean, you learned I mean, as far as going those three years. I mean, did you graduate? What happened? Yes, actually. Um, I met one lady, okay. Mrs. Fubara. That was my grade two teacher. Yes. She was so loving. Every time I crawled to school, she would bring a bowl with water in it, and I wash my hands. And she was so loving, she would sit by me, want to talk to me, but I wouldn't open up to her. Because I saw everybody as pretending. They don't really genuinely love me. Phony people. Yes. Yeah, I was talking about that a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. about imposters. Yes, well this lady showed me love up to the end of when I was supposed to write my final exams to go to the next class. 
she she just was always there but i didn't embrace her but one day when i was supposed to write my exams uh, it was raining it was a raining season in nigeria yeah everywhere was flooded i just can't crawl to school when it's like that yeah i was there thinking what am i going to do when my grade two teacher mrs Foba, came in the rain walked over to my left other students and came and put me on her back and took me to school. I love that lady to death. She was like my mother. She was like everything to me. So she came from left the students <coughs> and you wasn't there and she went and got you. So she actually left the 99 to go get the one. Absolutely correct. Oh, she, it's like I loved her and I said, why is she doing this? And she said, Sam is the Christ in me. Oh. You just have to embrace him. Is that the first time anybody loved you, touched you, what happened? That was the first time I had somebody touched me. That was the first time somebody carried me. Because I was, everybody saw me as disgusting. Everybody saw me as this kid with holes in his pants and everywhere. Nobody wanted to touch me. But she did. What was going through your mind as far as in regards to where is God in all of this as you being a kid and all this going, all, all the beatings every day and crawling to school? I mean, at that point, actually, I, I just felt, I, I don't know how I was feeling, but I felt like nobody cared. There, there is no God, actually. I felt like I just have to do something, I have to do it on my own. I was bitter with myself. I hated every part of me. I hated everything about me. Man. Yes, I, I just felt like I couldn't look at anybody in the eyes. My head was always down. I was this kid at the edge of the wall, all alone, all the time. All the time. And you just was just so disgusted. I was. I was. Mm -hmm. But far as when we come back, we will take a break. When we come back, let me ask you, how did that lady come and get you that changed your life? And the, how that affected you and what happened from there? This is Dr. Hatch. I'm talking to uh, Mr. Samuel Nehemiah. This is Dr. Hatch's show. I'm talking about from birth to death.